Hi, this is Fred Green with the eighth and penultimate episode in our series on the lessons from one of the most unsung heroes of golf instruction, Tony Manzoni, who passed away in 2018. Even though Tony had tremendous success with the men's golf program at College of the Desert and that he instituted a golf management program there, he didn't focus on men's golf only. Tony had tremendous respect for the women's game and also spent a lot of time working with children who were exceptional golfers and had a future as a professional. At one point in this conversation, we talk about some young players that he's working with. He mentions that he sent me videos of their swings. Unfortunately, I can't find them anymore, so I can't share them with you today. But it's that work with young people that was behind our motivation to create a tax-deductible fund at the first tee of Coachella Valley, home of College of the Desert, in his memory. To learn more about making a contribution and about Tony Manzoni, please visit our dedicated webpage at golfsmarter.com slash Tony. Make sure you put Tony in all lowercase. Tony's book, The Lost Fundamental, One Simple Move, Better Golf Forever, is available on Amazon in paperback or Kindle. And his DVD of the same name can only be seen online through our private channel. To gain access, please write to me directly via email, golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com, or click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com. Enjoy. Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans, your second chance to gain insight and advice from the best instructors featured on the Golf Smarter podcast. Great golf instruction never gets old. Our interview library features hundreds of hours of game improvement conversations like this that are no longer available in any podcast app. We all get nervous, and we all get anxious, and that never goes away, and hopefully never will, because adrenaline is a good thing if you use it properly. But if you set up to the ball properly, whether you're hitting the ball, chipping the ball, whatever, now your body dictates the distance the ball is going to go by its rotation and net and tempo. You can fine-tune this thing really quick, opposed to trying to time your hands when they turn over, how fast they turn over, and so forth. And those are the things that the modern swing even though this is not really a modern swing, but it's a modern way of teaching. You watch the tour now. You look at the guys when they step to the ball, you don't see anybody way behind the ball in a dress anymore. There was a guy by the name of Jerry Hogan that said, I want you to stand above the ball, but not behind it. And that's a great statement. With another interview from the archives of Golf Smarter, here's your host, Fred Green. I'm curious to go back to this this tournament that the two of you played together because um, recently in a conversation uh, with Mark Brody about Every Shot Counts, his book, and and we were talking about golf metrics and how he's saying that statistics show that the drive for show, putt for dough is actually backwards, that you really, if you hit the ball longer and farther, you're going to have lower scores. Uh, I should say longer and straighter. You're going to have lower scores because you're you're coming into the green with shorter irons, which are going to you know increase your chances of of hitting the green. Um, what was the key? What is it about you guys not hitting the ball far? But I, okay, you got a hole in one. But what is it that that beat them? And what can we learn well, from that? What what really happened? Uh, I kind of after the really after the first tee shot, uh, which was a was mediocre at best. Uh, I kind of felt something. Uh, it, it was like a little pre cocked position at address. Uh, and I don't, I, you know how things happen. And I started, you know, because I was playing from the, junior, the senior tees. Uh, I started keeping it up with this fellow, and on occasion even knocked it past him. And 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 I, I think I rattled him a little bit because you know on the first. The first he shot, he got me at, by at least 50 yards. Uh, so that was part of it. And then um, my iron play just got stupid good. I was just <laughs> drilling it in there. And I, I mean, I, I was laughing, truthfully laughing to myself. Like, when is this bubble going to burst? Uh, and just to think about this, how about going hole in one birdie? Okay. I mean, usually you go hole in one triple bogey. <laughs> right. You're excited. Uh, but it just, it, you know, I, I, I guess I kind of got out of my own way 
and I was in overdrive, and I got that feeling that no matter what I did, it was going to be good. And, you know, that, that they call that the zone. Uh, but, you know, the, you know, I have a 15 or 20 foot putt, bam, in the hole. Uh, 10 foot putt, bam, in the hole. 5 foot putt, bam, in the hole. It just, it just, just, they just went crazy. And then when I got a little bit conscious of it, you know, when you shoot under 30, uh, and then went to the other side, I had started with a par. Uh, I had eight holes to go. Yeah, I had a tough time because I was conscious. I wanted to shoot some, you know, your ego gets so blown out of proportion. Uh, so, you know, I, I, like I said, I think I was one under or something like that. Mm. But that one nine was magic. It was just, it, I thought, well, this is what it must feel like to be Tiger Woods or whoever, you know, <laughs> because, you know, it was it was just simple. It was just absolutely simple. Uh, getting back to what you said about something, I, I'd, I'd like to bring something up sure. from my past. Years ago, I was training some uh, ladies on the uh, LPGA when I was at Mission Hills, and I because I mean, they had the Craft Nabisco at that time, and I I, I, be, I became a big fan of ladies golf because I saw how great they hit the golf ball, but they couldn't hit it very far compared to a man. And I started thinking about it way way back when they had. It. Uh, a term, and I can't even remember the name of it, but it was a man and a woman against a man and a woman. Uh, so just for the fun of it, I started using the computer and looking at the distance that women hit the drive and also the second shot. And when I looked at what the ladies' tour was, hardly anybody was reaching par fives and two, and they were hitting long irons and and sometimes fairway woods to the par fours. Well, the men were hitting drives, eight irons, seven irons right in there all the time. And the long hitters were brought away with the par fours, you drive and wedge. So I compiled a distance advantage that I thought men, women should have over men. And I, wa- I wanted to set up a men, men tournament, uh, I mean, a women against men tournament. Hmm. And we, we came up with 75 yard distance. And I knew Sandra Palmer and some of the gals uh, from the Nabisco had and told them about it. And we went over to a golf course. And at that time, I could pop it out there 300 yards plus. Uh, so I played from the back tees, and then I moved the girls up 75 yards. And we hit our tee shots. And, well, heck, they were still ahead of me, even if I busted it, because they needed to be, because they they needed to hit. If I was going to hit an 8 iron, I hit an 8 iron at that time about 165, 170. They would have to be they would have to be able to hit an eight iron from their distance, probably about like 150 or 145. So they're, they, they needed that distance advantage also in the second shot. So it worked out great. And we played nine holes and they shot, they were all, you know, five under and they, you know, very excited. 31s, 32s for, for, uh, for, you know, part 36. So I, I got some people interested in my concept and they said, well, we'll fund that. It's Culinary Workers Union. And I went to uh, the PGA with the idea. And I'm trying, I can't think of the name of the, the, the guy. Then he was a big player. He was an attorney with glasses. And he immediately said, no, we would never do that because, the, the you know, we have nothing to gain. So I came back with my tail between my legs. And I met with Commissioner Ray Volpe, who was a commissioner for the LPGA at the time. And we talked about it. And I said, well, there is one chance. We could do the thing in in December when there is no tour. Uh, we could and we could do it like an old twerk dance. We'll have the gals invite the guys. So my friends that were sponsoring the thing, the Hotel Workers Union, they got the Dural Country Club, mm. and we had the gals invite. Boy, Sandra Palmer invited you know Arnold Palmer, and anyway, we had Trevino Palmer. We had everybody, uh, and we did this tournament. And it was a Ralston success. Didn't have it on regular television; had it on PBS. But you know, everybody really enjoyed the event. But they didn't play men against women. But they did give the gals a 75-yard distance match. The second year, Frank Sinatra, who I knew very well, said, "I'd like to sponsor that tournament, and I'll bring a Sears Roebuck in," which he did. And you know, long story short, just before the tournament was going to be announced. Mr. Sinatra's mom uh, flew, uh, was in a jet plane to go see him in Vegas, and they flew right into the Santa Rosa Mountains here in the desert. Oh. She died, and he had to back out of the tournament, and, of course, Sears went with him. So there I am now, and I had spent more money than I had 
trying to promote this thing and make the appearance of success, you know, fancy car, clothes, so on, because I was meeting with the Actors' Equity, uh, uh, which was uh, Mr. Sinatra's charities for actors that are down on their luck. And they either pay for their medical bills or so forth. Well, when I got the word from Mr. Sinatra's uh, people that, you know, he couldn't announce, obviously, you know, when mom died, you know, um, LPGA grabbed the tournament with the PGA and they had uh, waiting in the wings they had uh, J.C. Penney's and they, that's when it became the J.C. Penney's Mixed Team Championship and out of, uh, I think we, they played somewhere in Florida like Tampa or someplace like that and it was on TV for about 14 years and everybody said well you got a suit that was your idea and you have all this paperwork and I said look I was trying to promote ladies golf I, I don't give a damn about suing anybody uh, uh, I feel like I got, I should have been, you know, given a pat on the back or a gold watch or something. But the key thing that I, the key thing that I'm bringing this up about is not so much that I lost the term and everything, but the disparity between men and women's golf is distance. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not ability. Believe me when I tell you, uh, the gals can hit the hell out of the golf ball. And they can, I, I'll, I think there's a few gals out there that I'll put against the men in putting uh, any day. Uh, but they, they, you can't overcome the distance. And, you know, when Michelle Wee was coming out when she's 14 and doing so well, when people were saying she's going to go on the tour, they interviewed me. And I said, look, uh, you know, it, I could go lift weights uh, for 10 years, and then you put me in a cage with a bear or a lion or a, or whatever, and they're going to tear me apart. Uh, that's na- that's nature, and you, you, although the show is a wonderful little gal, and she hits the ball really good, no, she can't compete with a man. I mean, don't 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 be stupid. Uh, that's all that all that garbage. And I think p- the people that were pushing that hurt her. They put a lot of pressure on that girl. And I'm so happy to see her playing great golf again. Uh, but there's a dis- there's a d- distance difference, and when you say is there an advantage in lungs? Sure, there is. Of course, there is. If I've got an eight iron into the green, you've got four iron into the green, and we're somewhat the same. I'm going to beat your brains out. I mean, just it just goes well, well, it's just it's just science. I mean, it's just math. And it's an easier shot. You know? So you're absolutely right when you say that does mean something. But distance isn't everything. Uh, and that was proven this year when we were in the regional championship. I had a boy that could hit 340 off the tee with no doubt, but we played a real tight little golf course where you can't hit driver. They just lo- the, the designer just love you to hit driver so you could knock it out of bounds. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, he only hit three drivers out of bounds. So that's craziness. Uh, there is a point where you have to look at what the, what the, what the hole is, and then you have to say, okay, this is what I must do. I'm going to take double and triple and all that out of play by doing this. Uh, that's managing yourself on the golf course. That's what I try to teach my players. Sometimes they listen, and sometimes they don't. But, but distance is an advantage to a point. So now on the women's tour, we have an 11-year-old who's making headlines. Yeah, isn't that crazy? It's wonderful, actually. It's really wonderful. Tell me what you know about her and what you've seen and, and what your thoughts are about someone who can compete at that level at that age. Well, uh, you know, I saw that she had won the pitch and putt thing or was one of the winners yeah. at, at Augusta. And then turns around and, and gets on the tour or gets in a qualifier for the U.S. Open and makes it for the ladies. Uh, it doesn't surprise me, Fred. I've got a 15-year-old by the name of June Jang that's on my video. Um, I started her when she was a uh, little, little past 12 and, uh, recently she played in a major event in, uh, uh, it was called a silver bell event, you know, I think in Phoenix somewhere. And she shot 74, 64, uh, 70, uh, against 12, six year olds. Uh, and just recently, uh, she played in the golf week magazine, uh, tournament the previous year, she had shot 67, 71 to win it. And this year she shot 75 with a triple, uh, par five, which she tried to go into when there's water on both sides, and she learned a good lesson. But then she came back with 68, and she said, Coach, I hit every, every green, and she said, I missed so many putts, I could have had 59 today. And it wouldn't shock me if she said, Coach, I shot 59 today. 
that's how good these kids are nowadays. What they're doing is, when it, when it used to take us 10 years, they're compressing that into a year because they're practicing every single day. They got a wedge or a putter in their hand all the time. They're not thinking about, uh, they're not thinking about music, hairdos, nothing. All they're thinking about is how to get the ball in the hole. Uh, there, there's a mindset out there with a lot of young kids uh, uh, that just love the sport. But it's like what happened when the Beatles came out, every mom and dad wanted to give, give their kid a, a guitar to learn because they saw a chance for fame. And I think that's what's happening. Young people are starting to really discover golf. And, you know, you're like a rock star, for God's sakes, if you're really good in golf, if you're a star. You know, we see in the men's store, well, the same thing's going to happen to women's. But the women's will never be as popular as men's because that's just how life is. But but if you want to see quality golf, you watch the women play. It's 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 unbelievable. Uh, and, and, they're, and, they're, and they're getting longer. And when you read these stories about 11-year-olds making it, it's just great for golf and women's golf especially and but more importantly it's great for juniors for a kid to see my god an 11 year old make it mom get me a wedge <laughs> i mean it's at clubs uh you know we know that it takes a lot of hard work and you have to be a special kind of person to, to get all the way to the tour but it's still this is such a great sport it's such a great sport for a kid uh, it's a lifelong sport. It teaches you so many great lessons. And hey, every now and then, out of a batch of kids, you get one that's so special. Like Jiun is to me. I mean, she's like my she's like my daughter. I mean, I just adore her. And she is such a hard worker. Uh, I had a couple of big universities call. I can't. I don't want to mention their names, uh, but they're already looking at her, and she's a sophomore. You know, so. mm. It's fantastic. Uh, so it, it didn't surprise me. I mean, it did a, a little bit, but I didn't say, oh, my God, that's not possible, because it is possible. Sure. When you when you go to some of these AJGA events and some of the things that the PGA does, and those, those you know, they, they should be so thanked for doing that. Uh, and you see the talent that's out there. It's just, it's mind, it's mind-boggling. I've got a seven-year-old that I'm teaching right now, and I want to tell you something. He's got, a, he's got as correct a golf swing as anybody on tour. I mean, it's when I say it's perfect, it's perfect. And he beats the ball out there way farther than a seven-year-old should hit it. Uh, and where's he? what's he going to be doing when he's 15 or 16 if he continues this? And all he can think about it, he w- watches the golf channel. He doesn't watch SpongeBob. <laughs> you know, it's, it's crazy. Yeah? It's crazy. And I love it. I, mean, I just love it. So the 15-year-old, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is it uh, Jiyun Jang? Jiyun Jang, and she's on my video. And and, uh, and the swing that she had uh, is tighter and better than it was then. It was pretty darn good then. Because the you, yeah, at, at the end of uh, 2013, you sent me a couple of video clips of her swing. Um, and I will definitely put those up on the blog post, uh, with this show. Uh, but you also sent me the video of a se- the seven year old boy. W- what's his name? Ivan Tran. Ivan Tran. Okay. I'll put, I'll put yeah, those he- up so people can see what you're talking about. Cause you yeah, can I mean, see their swing. Crazy. They're short, they're short videos They're real quick. It's just the you know, kid swing, but yeah, you see but the all, swing. All you have to like, do is, yeah, you just look at the swing and say, holy macro. Yeah. I mean, how the heck did he do that? And in Ivan's case, I can't take credit for his swing because uh, he watched the golf channel and 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 copied it. Uh, and, so funny. And so when the, when his dad came to me and said, "Would you help my son?" and I had seen him hit the ball in the range because every time he comes out there, he draws a crowd. Uh, <laughs> I said, "Well, I said you've done a great job with him." He said, "Oh, he won't listen to me anymore." <laughs> I just I crashed up at seven years old. You know? But the the truth is, the dad doesn't play golf, uh-huh. and, the, and the kid knows that. So. Uh, I had such. I mean, I, I want to tell you something. Uh, I would pay to give this kid lessons, and I don't charge. I don't charge kids, but I would pay to give this little kid lessons because it's it's just a, it's looking at a phenomenon in the future. I mean, it's gonna be, you, this kid's going to do something in golf. It's going to be crazy, and he puts and chips like a pro. I mean, already 
Uh, he gets on the putting green, and you'll see all people putting. And everybody stops because they see him roll one after another, a 20 footer, one right after another, bam. And I just sit there and just watch it. The ball just keeps going in the hole. And he, he thinks that's what's supposed to happen. Yeah. Mm. It's fabulous. It really is fabulous. Well, so I've always been fascinated by young people who come up on the tour um, because it's, it's, golf is well beyond physical skills. There's the mental aspect. There's the emotional aspect uh, of dealing with the pressure of a Sunday round. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking a seven-year-old, he's going to bang it away. He doesn't even know or understand what it means to have the pressure uh, on, you know, with all the eyes watching and, and got to make this putt. I, how is the mental side for, I mean, these kids can hit balls like crazy all day long, but put them on a golf course in competition. What happens then? Oh, he, you know, Ivan has played in uh, a number of tournaments, which he's won or been in second place. Yeah, but you he's know, competing uh, against seven-year-olds, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, but, he, but, but, but the, this is the thing that I think that w- is happening like this 11 years old, 11 year old, uh, they see they can do it. They enjoy doing it and they love people watching them do it. Mm. So they don't have the insecurities and the feelings. Why well, can't I beat this? They don't. They don't even think that way. It's a totally different way of thinking, and and I think it's just the era we're in. You know, the, the kids are the kids are out of their shell really early because of television and whatever. Uh, and think think back when you were a kid uh, and things you did, and then and what's what's happening today and because of because of. And I don't think it's all good. Don't get me wrong, but because of Facebook and everything, everyone is more involved in the social aspect. So people have a tendency to be a little bit more. Uh, they're not so self-conscious. And you know, I'm I'm such a wallflower. I mean, I I remember going to a dance when I was a sophomore, and I, I was I was literally stuck against the wall, afraid to ask anybody to dance. That doesn't occur anymore. I mean, they're, they're, that doesn't occur anymore because of of the exposure that they have to everything. So kids don't have that fear that I think we, that we had because that's just how it was. Uh, well, so they're, in, say, they're I, in front of cameras a whole lot more than we ever were. I mean, there's no pictures yeah. of me growing up, but every young person I know, and I'm talking under 10, is so comfortable in front of a camera because there's being pictures being taken yeah. every few minutes. Yeah, and, and, and this is, you know, this period of time now is where people are showing off a lot. They're showing off the way they look, the way they dress, everyone's conscious of all these things. So, so I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't a few kids that still walk around hung up on this and hung up on that, but the majority are, are much more confident. Um, I, I know than, than when I was a kid. Uh, of course, I went to parochial school, and it was pretty, it was pretty strict. Uh, but these kids nowadays, uh, I mean, the boys that come in my programs, I mean, they're already, they, they've had experiences in their life that I didn't have until I was in my 30s, you know, uh, some good, some bad. But they've just been exposed to a hell of a lot more than I was. And so consequently, they think more adult. They just, they, mm. they just, they have, they have more adult feelings in the sense of, what they think about themselves. And I can tell you, Ivan, if I tell Ivan, hey, come on, I want you, I want you to drive for my boy's golf team, he can't wait to show them that he hits it better than them. <laughs> <laughs> let's get, I mean, he can't wait. Um, let's get back to mechanics for a minute because I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, because it's been asked of me about your methods. Um, the, uh, the swing for your short game, um, for pitching and chipping and not full swing, uh, how is that impacted by what your method is? With- well, you know, the, the uh, chipping method has always been that you play off, if you're right-handed, you put the majority of your weight on your left side, so th- that falls right back into what we're doing. Um, and modern-day chippers uh, are less handsy. They're more arm, shoulder, weight, left, and a, a small rotation, uh, just and the rotation gets bigger for the for the longer the shot, uh, but but there is a rotation, so they they keep the arms connected and, and it's still a body movement opposed to just the arms. Uh, not not to say that you can't do it with just the arms, but again, when you're using arms and hands, uh, you're bringing in 
the opportunity for the hands to overwork or for you to decelerate your arms. Where you stay connected and you turn through it, uh, the, the club is moving along with the body, so there's no hit to the ball kind of thing. Um, you have to be on the left side for sure because you want the club to be coming down when it strikes the golf ball. Uh, so that's part of it. Um, it. It's not It's not difficult for, for sure. It's not difficult. So... Um, when, when I, I you... think chipping. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Ahead. To I, I was just going to say, and then of course, uh, I, I teach the Paul Runyon type of ch- uh, chip stroke. So, so chipping where you're, you're all on the fringe and shortcut of the grass, you know, you're going to do that with seven and eight, and six irons. You're not going to be using sand wedge on those kind of shots. Uh, pitching when you're in the further back and heavier grass where the club has to come up down. Um, but you're still on the left side. It's just that's just more of a, you know, that's just more of the, what I say a body swing. Now, the real chipping where you set up to the ball and you you take the heel of the of the club off the ground so you put it up on its toe. And the reason you do that is because you want to get the shaft in the same position as your putter shaft so you get your eyes right down over the ball. Then you're just using an arm arm you know arm swing with a flat left wrist, um, very similar to your putting stroke. Uh, and that should be done around the green. You know, put put away your wedges around the green. You, you want you want to hit the ball and let it release and roll to the hole. You don't want to try to put backspin on all that. That's just silliness. Um, but when you're pitching the ball from a distance, you know, 30 yards, 40 yards, then you have to do use a miniature rotary motion, just like you do with the with the full swing. Real simple. Uh, oh yeah, sure. Real simple. <laughs> no, it really is. I honestly, when you, if for those for those of you that have chipping problems or anything like that, you ever come to the desert? I'll get rid of them in five balls. I mean, I, I promise you. And I don't care if you if you scoop it right at the bottom or anything. I have I teach uh, some PE classes, beginners, and uh, and I get and a lot of these people have never touched the golf club in their life, and in a very short period of time, everybody's got that handle ahead of the ball at impact and. It looks it looks great, but it's not hard to do. But if you, it's hard to do if you're trying to keep your wrist flat and your body still and your head still and you're pushing your arms. And then it's really hard. Then you're sculling them across the green all day long. But that's not the action. It's it's you have to set up properly and you have to understand what what the movement is. But then once you get the movement, it's really simple. Most of the time, I see that the mistakes that happen for for chipping um, is that people hit three or four inches behind the ball, and then well, it, the yeah, club head bounces. Because, and... Yeah, that's because they're staying behind the ball; they're not moving through the ball. Number one, or they're trying to they're trying to scoop under the ball, trying to get under the ball and make it go up. You'll hear people say they'll skull and say, "I didn't get under that one." Well, you don't get under it. You're hitting. You're hitting, you're hitting, you have to hit down on it, and the ball hits the face of the club, slides up the face, and then goes up in the air. Um, but you don't scoop the club underneath. The only shot that I know that you go underneath like that is a sand shot when you when you lay the club back. But but people try to do that. They feel like they have to help it up. And so in scooping, you know, what, 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 to scoop, you have to, you have to uncock your wrist. Your left wrist gets really cocked, and the blade goes up. So that that's that's the banana, you know. But it's easily fixed once people. You don't say don't scoop your wrist. You just show them. You show them a movement where they don't the wrist don't scoop. You you explain how the thing really works, and then then it's really easy. The problem is is that a lot of teachers uh, that teach say don't do this. Well, no, you see you scooped it or you did this, you did, and and so they're still fixated on that movement instead of getting them to do the movement that that eliminates that. Uh, but really, honestly, uh, if you, anybody wants to chip, they can go on any on, on any website. There's so many guys out there that that are, are saying exactly what I say because it's not a secret. And, and, and you know, keep in mind the tour is constantly looking for easy, the easiest way to do these things, not the hardest. So uh, if you copy uh, Mickelson or those kind of people, you'll see that they they have a process that they repeat over and over again. But why? That's that's where you, more strokes are lost, I think, inside the the thirty yard area than oh, anything else. Oh, there's no else. question about it. Yeah, no question about it. Uh, uh, I one of the parts of my formula for the golf team is that uh, 
you got to you got you got to be able to get it up and down from 50 yards and in. You just got to be able to do that. If you want to, if you're serious about being a competitive golfer, you have to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. And it sounds really hard, but it's really not because once you have a motion that is consistent, and then, then you just can dial in the, the, the rotation of your body for the distance. When you do it with your hands, now you know your nerve endings are at the end of the fingers. And we all get nervous and we all get anxious and that never goes away and hopefully never will because that's a good thing. Adrenaline is a good thing if you use it properly. But if you set up to the ball properly, whether you're hitting the ball, chipping the ball, whatever, and and you, now your body dictates the distance the ball is going to go by, it's by its rotation and that and tempo, well, you can, you can fine-tune this thing really quick opposed to trying to time your hands. Uh, how when they turn over, how fast they turn over, and so forth, uh, and and those are the things that that the modern swing, uh, uh, even though this is not really a modern swing, but it's the, it's a modern way of teaching. You watch the tour now. You look at the guys when they step to the ball. You don't you don't see anybody way behind the ball in a dress anymore. You know there was a guy by the name of Jerry Hogan that said, "I want you to stand above above the ball, but not behind it," and that's a great statement. And that's with the driver or anything else. Hmm. Interesting. You're going to have to come down and bring your wedge, a suitcase, a toothbrush, and a wedge. <laughs> and, <laughs> and just... It's going to be a long weekend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, suitcase, a toothbrush, and a wedge. Well, yeah, and maybe and maybe an eight iron so that I can show you the run up shot too. <laughs> I'll bring the putter, and we'll just play the entire round with three clubs. How's that? Yeah, there you go. Absolutely. That'll be interesting. I'd probably score the same. (laughs) Probably. Probably. (laughs) Oh, Tony, well, listen, I hope you have a full recovery. I'm so sorry about your accident, and I know that uh, I haven't asked in a while. How old are you now? I'm 77. Uh, oh my gosh! Uh, but I, 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 well, right now, I, when I had the accident, I felt 97. Yeah, uh, I bet. Because, because you're all of a sudden you say, "Oh, I'm falling now because I'm old." But th- but what happened to me? What if it was, if I was 15, I would have got the same result, unfortunately, because uh, and I actually the golf course. Uh, I, I I wonder what what will happen if another member gets down there where I was and tries to walk up that hill and slips, the result's going to be very similar because it was just, very, it shouldn't be that steep anywhere near the green, mm. but that's another story. I know a lot of people say, well, are you going to sue? And I'm not a suing type. I, you know, just that, you know, I think God had that plan for me to teach me patience because I'm, I get a little impatient. My girlfriend is looking at me now kind of nodding her head. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, you know, I have to look at it as it gave me some time to stop working seven days a week, mm. and uh, I caught up on every TV show that that exists for sure. Uh, but that's anyway, not something. That's not something me. you want to brag about. No, it's just <laughs> behind me now, and uh, and like I say, I'll once, once I get through therapy, uh, I'll be I'll be kicking and running again, just like I always do. Uh, just like you always do, and and dragging that team with you across the finish line ahead of everybody else. Hopefully, we can keep that up, baby. Oh, amazing! All right, Tony. Yeah. Well, it was great to talk to you again. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Uh, the Golf Smarter community loves you. We'll always love you. And again, the book and the DVD, The Lost Fundamental by Tony Manzoni. You're not going to find it anywhere else. Really, you can look everywhere on the web. You're only going to find it here. And so, um, and that's why you're getting such a, you know, the response from people all over the world. So, Well, I, I just want to thank everyone listening and, and leave them this thought that to please continue uh, supporting Fred. Uh, you are the voice of golf as far as I'm concerned. And, and uh, I think you're doing a wonderful, wonderful thing for a lot of people. 